Hello, beautiful people. It's uh, Quinton from the Hunters of Light. And today we are talking beauty and makeup retouching with Gemma. And I think it's going to be a fantastic uh, little chat. Uh, how's it, Gemma? How are you doing? Hi, hi, Quinton. A little bit nervous? <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Never done this before. So. That's fine. You, yeah, so, far, so far, you've been brilliant. <laughs> now, listen, it's... I, yeah, I, well, we got this whole thing sorted together in like four days or something absolutely, like that. So. Absolutely. You went from um, didn't know about Hunters of Light to now you're our retouching contributor. Um, I think it's, uh, it's fantastic. And I'm, I'm really excited to, to have um, your, your input on, on things like these live edits, but also, you know, on, ongoing as, you know, whether it's like little, you know, two minute tutorials or whatever, just quick little things that, um, that we can help people to improve their uh, retouching and uh, workflow, et cetera. And, uh, Cause we've had a couple of questions about post-production. So um, I think uh, this is, this is one part of it. And, and I think pretty important part of it. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, it, it's, it's, it's really, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be obviously uh, watching this thing intently because um, I'm an old dog. <laughs> I, there's a lot of new tricks that I need to learn. So, so that'll be really cool for me. Um, but it, I just think across the board, it's it's going to be really really cool for for people to to look at the the proper process or the, the professional process. And I know we spoke about things like, well, is it the right way? What is the right way? Um, and it, it, yeah. there are lots of different ways to do it. But I think that um, the, the 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 big thing at the end of the day is if if it works for you, fantastic. But you you kind of need to have a, um, a a starting point of 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 what would be I suppose best practice, um, and and take it from there. Absolutely. Um, and it's like you say, I mean, there's a million ways to do Photoshop and none of them are wrong and none of them are right as long as the result at the end of the day is what you are aiming for. And preferably you are working non-destructively. So basically if you decide halfway down the line, actually this isn't working for me, I want to go back and change something that you then have that option. That for me is the only, uh, in terms of saying it is correct or it's incorrect that that's the, that's really the only thing that you want to be doing you don't want to be trapping and painting yourself into a corner um but what's wonderful about being somewhere like hunters is that you've got so many different techniques and so many different preferences from your photographers on how they prefer to edit and how they want their final to look like um so i'm really excited not just to give my input but i'm very very keen to see what your photographers come back in terms of you know what they see is the perfect final result exactly and i think we also spoke about um looking at uh, uh, potentially doing a uh, what do we call it uh, the edit the raw or rock the raw something like that we'll we'll come up with a, with a, with a cool something name. like that yeah. yeah a lot of r's in there that's <laughs> it <laughs> um but i think that could be pretty cool because we what we then do is we have um maybe yourself and and another uh you know a retoucher or, or, or professional that uh, that does this um you know as part of their their, their business um but we open it up mm -hmm. to to the members as well and say okay guys so here's the raw Let's see what you do. You guys do an edit, yeah. and um, and then we see what uh, what comes back. I think that's like really cool because you, if you take a raw, um, I, I might have a sort of a more dark and moody style. Someone else is like light and bright, and and I think it can we can have some really really cool results. And of course, um, I'll chuck, try and uh, you know get uh, one of our sponsors to chuck in a, a bit of a giveaway uh, for the the best image or whatever. You know, we'll 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 make it really cool. So I, I think it's, it's, there's yeah. so much cool stuff that we can do. Um, and, and that's what makes me really, really excited about this. And of course, your sort of passion and excitement and, and eagerness to, to be involved um, is, is what uh, makes me, I suppose, even more uh, pleased that, uh, that you're on board because it's, it's, it's really this whole, the Hunters of Light is, is about passion and, and, and people just pulling together and saying, you know, this is how I do it. What do you think? Um, did you know this? Did you know that? Just educating, motivating, and inspiring. And, and, and you yeah. have been inspiring to me because you literally just said, okay, cool, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. What are we doing? Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. awesome yeah, awesome. It's, been, it's been a bit of a crazy week. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I hope I didn't keep you away from too much of your paid work. <laughs> uh, no, 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 not at all. Not at all. Um, no, for, for me, honestly, this is, I've, I've been doing this now for long enough. I feel like it's now time that I really do want to start giving back to the community. There's a lot of your photographers that I, I've already seen that are on Hunters of Light that have been 
massive, massive in terms of um, getting me to where I am now. So it's only fair that, you know, after X amount of years, I'm now giving back. Very cool. I love that. I think I think that's awesome, you know, and, and I really do believe that uh, we all have something that, that we can give back through. You know, it, 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 it may be small experiences, but um, I think, you know, when, when we all start giving back, uh, that's where everyone uh, benefits. So it's just, it's awesome to hear. Um, while, while we're on this, um, before you start, uh, have you seen any of the comments come up yet or not yet? I have not. Okay, cool. All right. So then, then what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll just let you know when, when, they, when they come up. Because um, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think we were, we were sort of work, trying to work out whether, whether you were getting them or not. But let's just have a quick look here. Um, so we've got uh, Trenley Meacham. He says, morning all. Ken Lovell, hi guys. Elizma Lo, hello all. Uh, Emmy, Emmy is there. Hey, he's. Uh, uh, there. Hey, Emmy. Uh, Emmy. I watched your last month edit for for outdoor photo. You you are awesome, awesome, awesome work. <laughs> yeah, Emmy, we, we we're going to talk to you. So <laughs> 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 expect our call. Uh, and then we've got uh, um, Pauline van der Spey. Hi there, Naomi Meyerberg. Uh, Taryn Goldman. So yeah, we, we've got uh, some fantastic. Uh, well, we've got an audience. That's awesome. Um, but I think Absolutely. you know what? Let's let's get on to um, what uh, what you want to do. Um, I think that uh, you know we, I was going to kind of do a whole thing. Well, we're going to talk about this and this and this. But I'm I'm going to leave it to you. In fact, tell okay. us tell us a little bit about your for the people that don't know you. Tell us a bit about uh, uh, Studio Rain. Um, what you do how long you've been doing it and, and maybe some of the clients just so that we'll, we, you know, sort of sell you a little bit. All right. No, no, no problem. Um, I love talking about myself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So we started Studio Rain officially. Um, well, I started it myself as Gemma Rain about two years ago. I started going full repro, uh, full retouching professional. Um, we started Studio Rain as a company after my husband joined me as a junior retoucher. That was beginning of this year, but I've been retouching since 2014. So I've been at it now for almost seven years. Studio Rain itself as a company is kind of growing uh, into the international market. We're picking up a lot, but we still do a lot of work with the South African photographers. Uh, I know some of your, your regulars here are uh, Sean Mallets on here. Uh, we do a lot for Silver Studios. We do a lot for... Oh goodness, uh, <laughs> there's quite a few, and I need to think. Uh, Dion from Vake, we've just gotten. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of them. Hey, I could not list everyone off the top of my head, but um, yeah, our clientele is just amazing. And what I absolutely love about this job is that I get to see so much from a lot of different photographers and a lot of what they're doing and their style and you know everyone's different everyone's got something that they want done differently and it's just amazing to see how different photographers can work with the same retoucher and yet we can produce such different results across the board and i, I think the cool thing uh, about that is is the you know you obviously have a lot of uh, influences um, you know, someone who, as I mentioned earlier, someone who shoots sort of dark and moody versus someone who shoots light and bright. Um, they're all wanting different things. And that kind of keeps you on your toes a little bit uh, because you, you know, you, otherwise you sort of get into this rut and you go, mm, 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 and that could be a bit boring. Um, you know, so it's, I, I think it's pretty cool that, you, that you've got all of those uh, uh, sort of inputs and influences. And then, of course, you, you uh, keep up with international trends uh, as well. Which, uh, which I, I think would probably also keep you on your toes to a certain degree. Yes, absolutely. Um, I've had quite a couple of photographers over the year who, who um, if they find that they're maybe getting a little bit bored with their style or they just want to try something new, that's also something that we, we've done quite a bit of is helping them develop their style or maybe they're new to photography and they haven't quite figured out um, where they want to go to in terms of the final image. Um, we'll often say, okay, cool give us a couple of images and we'll edit them in different styles. And then we're kind of going to work into the direction that you want to go. Even if they don't know what that direction is or that, um, at the end of the day, we, we end up finding them a style that's consistent throughout their portfolio. I think that's very cool. It's, uh, I didn't even think about that where, you know, you can, you can do a bit of guidance for, uh, for people and, 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 you know, see where they start off and, uh, and put them in a new direction or push them in a new direction. Maybe I think that's, that's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, 
it's super interesting to see. Um, and, and it's amazing how often, you know, you know, the words dark and moody or light and airy get tossed around a lot. But at the end of the day, you know, you can have four photographers that say, I've got a light and airy style, but they look nothing yeah, like yeah. each other. Absolutely. That's, that's very, very true. You know, it's, it's, I suppose it's the, the one thing with, um, with art and, and artists, uh, you know, you, the, 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 it's, it's not objective. You know, you, you're looking at it from a completely subjective viewpoint. And, um, you know, as you say, one man's dark and moody is another man's light and bright, I suppose. Yeah, eh? exactly. exactly. <laughs> oh, that's very cool. Um, all right. So are you ready? Are you? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, get into the, let's, let's do the thing that I'm good at because I'm not good at talking about myself. So let's, let's do the thing that I'm good at. Yeah. So, far, <laughs> so far, so good. All right. Let's share your screen over there and over to you. All right. Cool. So, guys, the first thing I'm going to mention is I'm just going to mention the boring stuff first. First of all, your screen calibration. I'm actually just going to scoot this over so I can see the comments if they come through. All right. So, I use a Spider 5 Pro to calibrate my screen. Um, I'm using a ancient, ancient iMac. I think it's 2013, <laughs> 2013 model. Um, it still works great for me. Um, I don't have a preference about screen. As long as your screen is calibrated, preferably with a calibration device of some sort, either a spider or whatever you prefer, I never recommend calibrating by eye simply because I, I personally don't trust my eyes that well enough, so I calibrate with a Spider Pro monitor monthly. The second thing I'm going to mention is I am using a Wacom Intuos Medium uh, pen tablet for my retouching. It is not a requirement, neither is the calibration monitor, by the way, but um, the Wacom or any pen tablet really does just make your workflow so much quicker and smoother, and especially when we go into the dodge and burn, which I will talk about in a little bit. Um, it really does just give you so much more control. So it's a wonderful toy to have if you if you are interested in going into more high-end retouching, but it's definitely not a necessity. A mouse works just fine. I worked on a mouse for many, many years before I could get a pen tablet. So with the boring stuff out of the way, I am going to jump into it. I uh, just want to check, Quentin, is, can you guys see my screen? Everything's all good. Yeah, all good, all good from this side. So, so I think that when you said that you you moved it across a little bit, um, it doesn't affect anything on on our side. So, uh, if you can see the comments, that's great. But if uh, you know, if, if and if you want to, you know, pick out uh, any of them and respond to them, uh, you can. Otherwise, um, if if I if I sort of uh, see one, I'll just uh, ask and we'll just take it from there. So it's it's pretty easy. All right, cool. Yeah. So um, when I'm in like when I'm in full screen like this, I unfortunately can't see oh, the okay. comments. I would. I, I would really appreciate if you could dictate them out. That would be great. Perfect. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry about that, guys. Um, <laughs> no, it's um, no problem. No problem at all. Technical problems. All righty, cool. So um, this was the image that I practiced on. This image was, and uh, Quentin, you're going to have to help me uh, give a shout out to the photographer here. Her name's Christy Strieber. <laughs> Striever, thank yeah. you, thank you. Yeah, so unfortunately, yeah. she couldn't. Uh, she couldn't join us today, um, because she's got a, another shoot on. Um, and I, I know she would have loved to uh, to be with us uh, today and, and add comments, etc. But um, she'll be able to see the recording on uh, on the Hunters of Light YouTube channel. So at least uh, you know she she won't uh, miss out on anything. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. If I'm not mistaken, this is actually a self portrait by her. It's fantastic. I yeah. really like this. Yeah, it's her, right. um, you know, self-portraits with uh, with food uh, series. I think they are absolutely amazing. No, it's great. It's great. I love it. It's so quirky. Um, okay, so this was the practice file that I did, and this is pretty much the final result that we are aiming to get to. So as you can see here on my layers panel, I've got quite a couple. Um, we're going to start with frequency separation. So. Here's our uh, raw image. We have already done our basic raw adjustments on it. Nothing too hectic, a uh, little bit of white balance, a little bit of exposure. Um, the only reason I unfortunately can't go into this is because Christy did specifically ask that we did not show the uncropped version. So we're just keeping to her wishes there. Um, so this is the raw. We haven't done anything on it yet. And the first thing I'm going to do is go into frequency separation. Now I have an action that 
runs my frequency separation for me, which is great. Um, and at some point, I think I will show how to set up that action. It saves so much time. But for now, I'm going to just kind of break down what frequency separation is and why it is so useful, especially if you were just starting up with screen retouching. So when you have an image like this, you've got tone and you've got texture on the skin. As you can see here, let me maybe just use that. Um, this would be classified as texture, you know, pores in the skin, hairs, uh, beauty marks, anything like that. Whereas your tone is pretty much your color. Um, it's basically how I've always described it as your, your texture is the very top layer of your skin, whereas your tonal layer is going to be the capillaries, blood vessels um, that are lying underneath the skin. So what's amazing about frequency separation is that we can separate the two of them, so we can edit them separately. Um, and the reason this is so helpful is if I say, for example, use my clone stamp tool, and let's say I want to take out this line. So you can see here, I've just taken a basic clone stamp tool and I've just tried to get that line out. And it's not very smooth. You can definitely see where I've gone in here. You can see where I've um, where we've got patterning on the skin. So that that's definitely not what we want. Um, especially if you're going to end up doing a whole face, that's going to take quite a bit of time. You can use a healing brush tool, but you're essentially going to end up with the same problem after a while. So with frequency separation, we're going to split the layers. I'm going to show you exactly how to do that manually. Um, we will talk more about actions, I think, in a different episode. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit Command-J, Command-J, or Control-J on the windows. I'm just going to make sure that these layers are rasterized. I had it as a smart object, but yeah, it won't work, unfortunately, as a smart object. You do need to use a rasterized uh, or a raster image. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to call this low frequency or tone. Ooh, how do I spell? Tone. And the top one, we're going to go high frequency slash picture, just so we can remember it. So the low frequency, we're going to hide the high frequency layer. We're going to go to filter, blur, Gaussian blur. I have a um, shortcut on my keyboard simply because I use it so often. And the amount that you want to blur is basically we're going to blur until we can't see the details of the skin. So as you can see here, I've got a one pixel blur. It's still very obvious that there's skin detail. So we're going to go up a little bit. 2.6, still too low. So we're going to go yeah, about, about there. This will differ on every single image that you use. Um, it'll, you'll blur more if the subject's closer to the camera. Um, it's going to depend on every single subject. So yeah, maybe maybe just a little bit more. Let's go, not quite 12, let's go about 11. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Okay, so we're going to hit OK, and it's going to be all blurry. We can still see a little bit of like the bigger details of the skin, like um, beauty marks and whatnot, but mainly the texture we've, we've lost. So now we're going to pop our high frequency back on. We're going to go to image, sorry, apply image, and here under the layer, we're going to select our low frequency. We're going to say invert selected, and we're going to say add. And our scale is always 2, and our opacity is always 100. Uh, don't ask me to explain the math on this. Some, some person who's a lot cleverer than I am figured this out a few years ago, and it's just been amazing ever since. But this is the, um, the settings that you always want for the applied image. So we're going to hit OK. And now under our blend mode, we are going to change that to linear light. Now, if you've done it correctly, I'm going to just put those into a group, there should not be any difference between your original image and your frequency separation um, uh, group. So I like to think of the low frequency tone as I, I, I explained this to someone a while ago. Imagine if you've got a, plastic, a clear plastic bag and you've got a colorful napkin and you've put it inside. So when they're together, they complete the image. So it looks 100% perfect. If you take them apart, your napkin or your cloth is your tonal layer, your color layer, and your high frequency layer is that clear piece of plastic. So if we, are, if we turn everything off, you can see it's gray. That's actually see-through. So I want you to imagine it as a textured piece of glass. There shouldn't be any color on this. We might get a little bit of color spill, but 
that's inevitable. But for the most part, it's basically a see-through texture layer. And when you mix it with this blurry tonal layer, they, they form the completed image. So what's amazing now is we can edit them separately. How I prefer to do this is I duplicate my low frequency layer and I also add in just a clean layer for brushing as well. So the low frequency layer or the tone layer, the, or rather the copy layer of that. And the only reason I do this is so that if we do make a mistake, we can go back and fix it. I like to use the lasso tool to begin with, with a feather of about 15. Um, you can use whatever fe feather works for you, but I would not suggest going lower than 10, otherwise you're gonna get quite a harsh line when you start blurring. I'm gonna hide our high frequency, and here on the places where we can see it's a little bit blotchy, so here on the cheek, here on the chin, uh, let's look down here, a little bit here on the collarbones, that's where we're gonna just basically blur out a little bit more. That's basically just to get rid of the blotchiness without distorting our color too much. So I'm just going to select, and I hit Command H just to hide it so that I can see exactly what I'm doing. And you would go to Filter Blur, Gaussian Blur. I'm just going to hit Command B on my keyboard. That's my keyboard shortcut. Um, but if you want to do it manually, it's uh, here. Let me just show you again. Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur. And we're basically just going to blur it just a tiny bit more than what we did initially. So about 16 is fine. And we're just going to keep on doing that. New selection every time for where we feel we need to change it. Cool. Right, let's turn that layer on and off. Yeah, small change. I don't know if you guys can see it very well, but yeah, very, very slight change. So the one thing with um, skin retouching is less is more. Almost always less is more. Um, we, we took this image pretty far, but in all honesty, most of your skin retouching is better done in a controlled and not over the top way. So we're gonna grab our brush layer as well, and I just wanted to check my brush settings are correct. Yeah, so I've got my transfer on because I'm using a pen pressure pad. It will pick up um, my flow jet using my pen pressure. I'm gonna turn shape dynamics off. Um, and I've got that. Yes. Um, I, I don't know why, but we can't see your uh, flyout uh, menus. Oh, that's strange. So I, I don't know if it's, um, uh, I actually have no idea why it wouldn't be showing. It's. Um, that's so strange. Because you, it, you've, you've shared the, the, the application window. So all of that stuff should, uh, should come through in there. That's, that's very odd. That's very odd. Okay, I will dictate, I will dictate as I go through everything. Um, yeah, well, just to how, how have you is it a full screen that you've that you've it, made it? It is hang tight. Let's just see if we can't get it. Let's see now. Any better? No, no, I still can't see it. Okay, no, that's fine. All just right. then, just, I think just let us know as you as you go through it. Um, All right, cool, no problem. So your brush settings, and unfortunately, you guys can't see, so I will just need to say this out loud. So I keep my opacity at 100% always, and I adjust how much I impact I want my brush to have with my flow. On your brush settings underneath transfer, you'll see you've got opacity jitter. I keep that on 0% and I keep the control off. And underneath that, you'll see flow jitter, which I keep at 0% and I keep my control set to pen pressure. This basically means that the harder I press, the more impact the brush will have. Um, again, this is for a pen tablet. If you are using a mouse, this is not gonna make a difference, in which case I would suggest setting it the opposite way around. I would suggest having your flow at 100 and having your opacity be the controlling factor. But because I'm on a pen tablet, I'm gonna keep it this way. I would also suggest having this uh, icon selected. It just means that your uh, flow is your uh, dominant controller. 
Okay. I hope I hope that was um, that was uh, concise enough. It's very strange and very difficult to see if you don't have the the window pop up. Yeah, I was, I was okay. just, uh, just going to say, I was following it until I thought, well, hold on a second. Um, I see your mouse is moving where those panels should be, but uh, the panels aren't there. So what's fine. I, I think yeah. what, what we can do is we can just follow through. And maybe what, what we can actually do is um, in, the, in the final uh, um, uh, video that we put on YouTube, uh, we can you we'll know, o overlay a, a, a bit of a screen grab or, or something like that, just so that um, yes. that we know exactly what uh, what should, should be coming there. Yeah, I agree. I agree one hundred percent. Okay. And, cool. and Rudy Rudy Silberman says um, Gemma the champ. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Rudy Rudy was the guy who basically um, pretty much started my career as a retoucher. He was my very first uh, client. So yeah, I owe him a lot. So it's awesome that he is here watching. He's probably going to make fun of me for this for, for many years to come, I bet. <laughs> Welcome, Rudy. <laughs> All right, cool. So once you've got your brush settings the way you want them to, uh, and just make sure that you have quite a soft brush with a decent amount of spacing. So let me just check here. I've got mine on a 32% spacing and a 0% hardness. Alrighty. So on our brush layer, this is where we can just basically control our tonal layer even more. So let's say for instance, here on the nose, this shadow is kind of bugging me. It's coming out a little bit too far. So I'm just going to grab here on this highlight and I'm very softly just going to start painting that back. And here, I'm just going to extend the shadow a little bit. I just want to check, you can see my mouse, yes, right? Yes. You can see the, the, the brush circle. Yes, we can. Oh, that's, oh, that's great. So I'm just going to do that. And that is just basically using it to shape our tone. So if there's any blotchiness or anything that you're not quite happy with, that you don't want to use the lasso and blur for, then this is just a really nice controlled way of doing it. And I should point out at this point that I am actively avoiding the makeup at the moment. I will get into the makeup a bit later. I'm just focusing on the skin for the moment. Uh, even here on the neck, I'm going around the makeup lines. We will show you exactly how we do makeup retouching as soon as our skin is great. So now with this being said, I did go ahead and do this on the other one uh, on our, our practice file earlier. So if I feel that we are taking up too much time, because Lord knows I can spend way too much time on <laughs> individual things, um, I will swap over to the other image just so we can kind of speed it along. Otherwise, we're going to be here all day. And I'm pretty sure you find folks have better things to do on your Saturday than listen to me wobble on about this. All right, cool. So let's have a look. All right. Um, I feel like I went a little bit too far there. So the wonderful thing is, and this is what I was talking about working non-destructively, is now I can just pop a mask onto it. And using black, it's still 10%. I can just paint that back just a little bit. So I just feel like I, I overdid her nose just a bit. All right, I'm pretty happy with the tone. It looks pretty even. I might wanna do just a little bit more over here. Not too much. Um, yeah, okay, cool, I'm happy. All right, so now we're gonna go into a high frequency texture layer. So we're gonna use the clone stamp tool. And it's very important that you always have the clone stamp set to current layer when you are working on the top texture layer. Otherwise, you are going to get some very, very strange results. Let me show you here. Yeah, um, not, not quite what we're after. Because that layer is see-through, if you select current and below, it's gonna start putting color into it and it's just gonna have really, really weird consequences. So now we're working on our top layer. We've got our um, clone stamp set to current layer. And I like to have a little bit of a hard brush about between 50 and 75%. It's just so that we don't get an overly softened look on the skin itself. So you saw me try and take this out previously without using frequency separation. Here it is with it. 
It is just so much cleaner, so much smoother. I don't need to focus on, okay, wait, where am I pasting from? Um, because there's no color involved, it's just the texture. It's going to work it out for us. So Very nice. That is gone. We can do it on larger sections like here. I think she had a little bit of a blemish. Uh, it's a bit strange uh, working on a self-portrait because I'm also trying very hard at the same time to not insult the photographer. Um, <laughs> the, the photographer um, and the makeup artist and, and, and who are all in the no, same so picture. I think this is, now, this, is, this is now a good time for me to say, Christy, you've got fabulous, fabulous skin. Yes. Truly, you do. We all have flaws. This is not... Um, this is not something that um, needs to be corrected. It's simply a good example. Um, so please, if you feel like I'm, I'm tearing your beauty regime to pieces, um, I'm, I promise I'm not. <laughs> I think you recovered well from that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So any, any uh, flaws in the skin that you feel are not really adding to the to the photograph you can take away. And here is where every photographer and every retoucher will be different. Um, for me, I, with frequency separation, will just take out the non-permanent um, features and maybe a couple of beauty marks if I feel they don't really add to the overall image. But I'm not going into the pores. I'm not really going into the hairs. Um, Unless, again, it was something like this, which, you know, detracts rather than adds to it. Um, and it's, it's a massive debate, honestly, in uh, beauty retouching what you leave in and what you leave out. Um, and truthfully, there is no correct answer. It, it is what bugs you. It is what you feel needs to be um, taken away or added. And it's also what your client expects. Um, but what I will say is the industry is currently looking in a direction where it looks at uh, beauty retouching in a much more natural way. People don't want this porcelain, um, unrealistic look anymore. They want something that is human, but maybe just um, a bit cleaner than your average human being. It's, it's incredibly controversial and, um, you know, it, it can be a bit soul destroying if you know that your model is great and has great skin um but with that being said sometimes it is what the client wants so don't be afraid to take out things as long as you are not affecting what she looks like overall she should still be recognizable yeah i think that's that's the 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 thing that um that i prefer i prefer something that's a little bit more honest uh, than than that um, completely porcelain uh, look. You know, I mean, I I know that uh, I can I can definitely be accused of not going far enough, but um, you know, I I just prefer to keep it a little bit more true to what uh, what the person actually looks like. I I always say in retouching, if you have to decide between overall under go under every mm. single time. Yeah. Um, uh, but the, the mark of a good retoucher is that you should not be able to tell that an image has been retouched. Um, the minute someone looks at it and says, oh, well, that's Photoshop, you, yeah. you have not done a great job, um, which is why I say I think we did go a little bit overboard in our practice, but it's more for the demonstration than it is for, <laughs> excuse me, the final result. Absolutely. So you can see here I'm taking out all of the goose flesh on her, um, on her neck, uh, leaving a bit in because we don't have that much time. Here I might take this um, little skin fold out. I'm going to leave this one in. I didn't on the last one, but I think actually, yeah, let's leave it in. It's, it's not really bugging me. Um, these ones I'll take out. You'll also notice I left all of the freckles on her shoulder, whereas, you know, 10 years ago in the retouching um, spectrum that that's a that's a massive no no freckles are so in at the moment please yeah. if your model has freckles leave them in we love them we love them please don't take up their freckles <laughs> um, all righty cool I'm not going to spend all day on that although I probably could um, all right yeah but I think that looks pretty good let's zoom out so we can see that's already a nice. huge difference yeah 
quite a big difference. Oh, I think let's just grab here these lines up here. Now, just be careful when you're working on something like makeup or something that's got a pattern to it. You need to um, clone stamp from a source that is going to um, work well with this particular spot. So in other words, here we're kind of working on this corn kernel. I'm going to take from this corn kernel <clears throat> to make sure that it goes over nicely. Whereas if we're working like here in the center where it's dark, I'm kind of going to pull from here. So, no. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't try and sample from her hairline or inst yeah. for instance, because that's going to be very, very strange. Um, you want to keep the texture as close to each other as possible. And okay, here, just this little line. All right, so that's so any bit of um, makeup retouching that I'm going to be doing with frequency separation. The rest I'm all going to be doing on a totally separate layer. Uh, scratch that, maybe, maybe just here under the eye, just a little bit, simply because that's going to be quite difficult to remove later on. I'm just going to ask while while you're carrying on with that. I'm just going to ask the the, the people that are watching uh, if they can put in the comments whether they use a mouse or a, a tablet of some description. Um, I think it'd be quite interesting to see what uh, what people are using to retouch their uh, images. Yeah, I'd love to know as well. Frequency separation is is perfect with the mouse. It's really only the dodge and burn that um, becomes a bit of a, a nightmare with yeah. it. Um, but you can retouch an image from start to finish using frequency separation. I personally like using both because they've got their pros and cons. Um, so if you are using a mouse, I would say really try and perfect your frequency separation. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take you really far. But while we're waiting for that, I am going to just quickly show you what the final result from uh, this side looked like with regards to our frequency separation. We actually weren't too far off now that I look. Yeah. All right, cool. So that was our practice file. There we go. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to go into is dodging and burning. And this honestly is my favorite technique of all time. Um, I did frequency separation for many years. And the minute that I found out about dodge and burn, it kind of went out the window. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just want to quickly touch on the term a little bit because it can get a bit confusing. Dodging and burning basically comes from, the term comes from film photography where you would, uh, it's an exposure term. When you are developing your film, you would expose it to a certain amount of light. The more light that you exposed it to, the darker it got because it would literally burn the film. So that's where the term burn comes from. It burned to make darker. If you wanted to, um, keep a part of the film at a bright exposure, you would typically use some sort of a block, maybe a piece of paper or something like that to dodge the light. So that's literally where the term uh, dodge and burn comes from. Um, it refers to that, um, that film exposure. So when we say burn, we mean go darker. And when we say dodge, we mean go lighter. So, I use curves adjustment layers for my dodge and burning. So on your curves adjustment layer, you're going to see there is a white line running from the bottom left to the top right. If you click in the center of that, you're going to get a little dot in the middle. And you're going to drag that down to about, uh, you'll see it's, it's uh, sectioned into a grid. You're going to drag it one grid line down. All right, we're going to do the same with the dodge. We've now popped our curves adjustment in there. We're going to make sure our mask is black. And with the dodge, on the curves adjustment layer, exact same thing. You've got a line running from uh, bottom left to top right. You're gonna pop a dot in the center of it and you're gonna drag it up one grid line. So what the burn has done is, and I'm gonna show you this now, this might be easier. So the burn has darkened our, our image. That's what that curves adjustment layer has done. And the dodge has lightened it. Now, we're gonna paint on the mask to control where we want that dodge and burn to appear. In this case, we're going to use it for skin retouching. Um, we can also use it for contouring, which I will show you guys at the end of the tutorial. But for now, it's going to be for skin retouching. The other thing I really like doing with this is I pop on a black and white adjustment layer. And on my reds, I just take it down a little bit. This just gives you a really nice... Um, 
a high contrast view of the skin so you can really see, okay, what, what am I trying to take out here? So the concept is pretty simple. We make lighter what we want to make um, what is too dark and we make darker what is too light. So we're going to go back to our brush. And I've got the same settings as what I used uh, in the frequency separation. The only difference is I've got a flow now of around between one and 3%, depending on um, how heavy handed you are. So we've now set up, it's all good. I'm just gonna pop this into a group so that we can see the before and after, and I'm just gonna call it DB. And let's jump with our dodge first of all. So, this is going to be different for everyone. Again, you're going to know when it's too far and when it's not far enough. What you don't want to do is make the mistake of going right in here and start coloring in these little individual pores. You're going to be here for the rest of your life. So start out pretty zoomed out and you're going to identify the larger portions of where your tone is not quite right. So let's say for example here, on her top lip where it meets her cheek. I feel like this could be brightened up quite a bit. And I am going very, very gently. I am not uh, pressing too hard. I'm not... Um, yeah, you've only got your flow is only like 2%, so that's, um, that's quite low, hey? Huh? It's very low. It's very low. Um, even if I can show you now, let's set it to something like 6, which you, know, you wouldn't expect is going to make that much more of a difference. Let's try here. Already you sure. can see that's... That's too much. That's crazy. So keep it low. The lower the better. Rather spend a bit more time on it than um, going too harsh. Uh, interestingly enough, though, the closer you go, I find, uh, as in the more zoomed you go, um, uh, the, the more the more um, flow I tend to have. So if I'm working quite up close, I'll sometimes have a flow of maybe about 4%. Um, simply because those very dark little pores tend to take a while to kind of brush out. So yeah, here you're just going to, and again, we're, we're zoomed out to 33%. So we're really doing the big spots. The other thing that you're going to be constantly doing is you're going to be adjusting your brush size all the time. You don't want to have a brush that's too big or too small for the location that you're working in. Otherwise you're going to get, um, it's not going to be it's not going to be a seamless mask. So let's say, for example, this bit on her cheek, I want to dodge out, um, but I've got too small of a brush. We're going to start getting some like interesting lines and stuff like that, which we don't want. You want it to be smooth. You want it to be pretty seamless. Yeah. And I think, as you as you mentioned early on, you know, lots of of small subtle uh, changes. Uh, yes. that, that'll help you build on, on the look that you're trying to achieve. Because if you, as you were doing now, just showing us that example, if you just go, cha -cha 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 -cha, you know, there's this massive white streak that goes through there. Um, Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Um, so the, the big downside to retouching is that as much as we, we live in 2021 and, you know, everything's automated, unfortunately, when it comes to good retouching, it is simply slow and steady wins the race. And it's mm. practice, practice, practice. There is no quick fix to get Vogue level editing. They're well, there, just, there is, just... there is. We send it to you. That's, that's a very <laughs> quick fix. That. One email you and it's do done. <laughs> yeah, but there's, there's that, there's that. Um, but this does take quite a bit of time. It's not pressing a button. Most most people think photo uh, Photoshop's magic. I promise you it's it's not. I wish it was. Um, <laughs> so I suppose while, right. while, you, while you're busy doing that, if, if you wouldn't mind, um, when, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, costing for things like this, I mean, you know, I, I suppose a lot of it will depend on the, 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 the clients, um, what, what their budget is, what they're willing to do. But I suppose, I mean, I mean you, you just think about this, this, this uh, you know, if you're retouching a, a high-end portrait, I mean, it may take you the whole day to, uh, to do it. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's not necessarily going to work for your corporate uh, portrait client when you say, listen, I'm going to be charging you for seven hours of, um, of uh, you know, retouching and they're just going to freak out. No, it definitely doesn't. Um, and beauty retouching is a whole other spectrum in of itself. So um, 
what would actually be fantastic is if at some point I can do a, a corporate headshot just to show the difference between I'm going in here and I'm really worrying about the pores yeah. and like tiny micro flaws and stuff like that versus a corporate headshot where it's like, we just kind of want to make you look like five to 10 years younger kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe, maybe what we can do is we can, we can do um, the little two minute tutorial or the, you know, something like that where um where we just uh, quickly go through what it uh, what it would be to to do a, a corporate portrait i mean maybe, maybe that's something that uh, that we can look at uh, in the future yeah absolutely so we actually offered something called the the perfect portrait um it's one of our um better options for retouching and we describe it as one level below beauty so basically i use the same techniques as what i'm using now the only difference is what my choices in what I'm focusing on. So here, for example, I mean, I'm, I'm here on the chin. I've got a flow of about 5%. As I mentioned, the, the closer I zoom in, the um, harsher my flow gets. Right. I mean, I'm focusing here on these tiny, tiny little imperfections in the skin, you know, which you normally would never even notice. This is the other thing about beauty photography. Um, we tend to light it in such a way that it's actually very unflattering for the skin. Um, bright lights, um, fair bit of shadowy contrast. Mm. So, um, whereas corporate headshots and weddings and such and such, we tend to light our subjects in a in a more flattering way. Beauty is actually an incredibly unflattering look, um, which is why when you look at it, um, you think that the model is so flawless because our brains are busy telling us, oh wait, that they should look terrible in that lighting. <laughs> in the meantime, they look they look absolutely perfect. Um, so it's it's not just a case of, okay, let's put a filter on it and call it a day. It, it really is a lot about choice making with regards to your final, your final image. Now, the one thing I did do on the practice image, which I don't think I'm gonna do today, simply because I don't think we're gonna have enough time is I did take these hairs out, um, which you can do with dodge and burn. Um, you can also use the clone stamp tool. Um, you can also create a new layer and put a dust and scratches filter on it um, if they are really, really bothersome. Uh, let me just turn this black and white off quickly so you can see. Yeah. So, the other thing to note with Dodge and Burn is that it does sometimes alter your color. Um, not always. Sometimes you are lucky enough that you can Dodge and Burn an entire image and it doesn't mess with your color at all. In this instance, I don't think it's doing too much um, in terms of changing the color. Let's just turn that on and off. Yeah, no, it's not really having a huge impact. If it does, however, if you are working on, let's say, um, Hair in particular can be one of those um, one of those sections that the color tends to go a bit crazy on. It's a very simple fix. We're going to pop a new layer on. We're going to set the blending mode to color, and with our brush set to about thirty percent flow or thirty percent opacity, depending on if you're on a brush or Wacom. Um, we're just going to sample the color next to it, and we're just going to paint over. Now this is a terrible example because this wasn't changing the color. So you can see we've got a bit too pink there. I don't know if you can see. Um, but if you are dodging and burning and you find that your color is going a little bit weird, that's a great tip to just try and correct it back. So it's not going too orange or too brown or something like that. Gemma, quick question. Taryn wants to know, um, have you ever done photography? And I know we, we, discussed, uh, we discussed this a little bit yesterday. Um, what, what, what you, but, and you coined the term a fail, a failed photographer. Just tell us, a, yes. tell us about that. Yes, you did photography. I did. Um, I studied at Open Window with a major in photography um, and loved it, thought it was fantastic, said, okay, this is it, I want to be a photographer. Um, and photographed up from 2014 all the way up until 2019. And I just found that I, I truthfully loved the post-production side of it more. Um, I didn't even really realize that being a full-time retoucher was a, was an option until about two or three years ago. Um, we 
rather I, I did a lot of weddings. I worked with Daryl Fraser a lot um, with her weddings. Um, did beauty quite a bit, did a lot of products and just found that, you know, whenever I was in the studio, um, I, no matter how good my image was on, on my camera, I would always be so much more excited to sit down and Photoshop with it. Um, <laughs> so, oh, dear. Yeah, after, after we started um, doing retouching full time, I just decided, you know what, um, I'm actually cool. I can put the camera down. I'm okay. Um, I'm okay doing the retouching. I, I still pick it up now and again, um, more for a hobby, but honestly, the, the, my, my, my passion lies in Photoshop. There you go, Taryn. Right. Okay, I'm not going to spend all day on this. I will show you on the practice file how far we went with our dodging and burning. Let me find it. Yes. Okay. Whoops, sorry, that is the, that is the um, contouring dodging and burning. Right, here we go. That's better. All right. So we went quite far. Um, it probably took me a good hour or so of just dodging and burning. So you can see this is quite extensive. Um, here, I'm just also going to show you my mask because sure. I always think it looks really cool. Just That's to see amazing. the kind of brush. That, just I've to actually see the never kind of brush seen that before. Yeah, it's pretty cool. If you hit um, Alt and click on your mask, you can yeah. see exactly what your mask itself looks like. Um, so yeah, just in terms of seeing your brushwork, that that for me is a very very cool Fantastic. thing. Fantastic. See. Alrighty, cool. I just want to quickly see what my other layers are doing, so you can, I can tell I did a little bit of go. <laughs> um, right. Cool. So let's pretend our dodging and burning is now done to that level. Um, I'm also just going to go in here and I'm just going to take away these flyaways. I'm putting a layer underneath my dodging and burning and on top of my frequency separation. The reason I'm doing that is the dodge and burn there, because we're using adjustment layers, they're technically see-through. So what you do underneath them in terms of a pixel base edit will um, not affect your dodging and burning. If we were to put our pixel base um, edit on top of the dodge and burn, it would affect that dodge and burn underneath. So just always make sure that you keep any adjustment layers that you use on top of any pixel-based layers that you do. So here on layer two, I'm just going to call it clone. I'm going to grab my spot healing brush tool. By the way, I am using Adobe Photoshop 2011. I find that with every Photoshop update, honestly, their tools become so much smarter and better. Um, if you are using an outdated version of Adobe Photoshop, it might not... Um, it might not correct quite as nicely, but I find that the healing, the spot healing tool on um, spot healing tool is it the spot? Yes, the spot healing tool on uh, the twenty twenty one version is actually quite powerful. So just these flyaways, um, and what's wonderful about this is I don't need to source. Photoshop picks up um, automatically what I'm trying to get rid of and tries its best to blend it seamlessly. I'm not going to try and get rid of every single little flyaway there. I'm just going to try and get the, the ones that are the most bothersome. And it also helps to zoom out quite a bit because then you can tell which ones are really uh, distracting. I think so that's again, the other I'm thing with... The full Sorry to interrupt you there. I think that's the other thing with um, the, the, the different types of shoot. You know, if you've got uh, something that's, that's quite a big production, you're going to have uh, hair and makeup, et cetera, that are going to be faffing over those sorts of details. Um, you know, whereas mm. a, a corporate portrait or even, uh, you know, with uh, Christie self portraits, uh, you know, the, it, there's not going to be as much detail uh, or, or time spent on those sorts of, of details. So, you know, there's uh, different shoots will, will throw up different um, scenarios uh, as you go along. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, it's all about the choices you make. Um, I'm not even going to go too extensively on her hair, um, you know, otherwise she, she's going to look too polished. Um, so you can see I've taken out a couple of them that are really bugging me, but I'm really not going too crazy. Uh, what I will show you is a really, really fun and cool way to take these flyaways on the edge of the hairline out. Um, 
This will work if you've got a plain background like we have here. If you don't have a plain background, rather than using the brush, use the clone stamp tool. I'll show you exactly how it works. So I'm going to create a new layer, um, and I'm going to call it Bioways. If I could spell. <laughs> <laughs> That's like my spell. Uh, my, my brain works faster than my fingers do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to take our brush. Again, we've got a plain layer, so we can use the brush tool. I'm going to set my flow to quite high, about 60%. Um, you could go as much as 100 if you're pretty confident with your, with your brushwork. I'm going to keep it there. And I'm basically going to brush the background quite far over her head, and I'm resampling as I go so that we don't end up with a solid color. I'm just going to cover up all of those flyaways here on her right-hand side as well. All right, that looks pretty good. And then I'm going to go to filter and I'm going to go to noise, add noise. I'm going to zoom in 100%. I don't know if you can see this box. If you can't, I apologize. Yeah, no, we can't but see the box, but it's fine. Uh, it's so annoying. Okay, so your box will say amount. And then underneath it, it'll say distribution. And you've got an option between uniform and Gaussian. And you've got a monochromatic option. I have monochromatic selected. I have uniform selected. And my amount is, yeah, one looks good. So if you've got a particularly noisy image, you're going to increase it a little bit to basically match the noise of that background. If you've got um, a very non-noisy image, then you can stick to about 1%. And what that basically does is it just makes it look like it was part of the original background as opposed to something that we've just painted on. Now we can mask it in. So I'm going to put a black mask on it and set my flow to 100. And here, now we can just paint out the flyaways that we don't want, as opposed to going in and individually selecting uh, or clone stamping over every single strand. We can just kind of brush them up. Be a bit careful with this because if you start being um, like, let's say, for instance, I actually want to leave this in, but these little hairs here are a bit strange. So you might just need to think carefully about which hairs you leave in and which hairs you take out. But it's a lot easier and you run a lot less risk of your image becoming muddy or blotchy by using a clone stamp or a healing brush tool. And this is obviously where the importance of, of, of continuously selecting the, the background color when you're doing that, uh, uh, you know, the painting is, is, is really important because otherwise all these little areas where your, your, your uh, mask is going now, you'll see those as, you know, either lighter or darker than, than the surrounding areas. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, even though to our eyes this is a solid color background, it's not quite. And you yeah. can see a little bit where my mask is coming out. So if that happens, then rather take a bigger brush and just kind of overblend it. So that way we're not going to see where those little lines are coming from. Again, I'm not going to keep on this all day, because otherwise we will be here all day. It's funny, when, when, I, when I'm doing this just for myself, I, I retouch so much faster, but when I'm talking and explaining it through, I feel like I'm going terribly, terribly slow. <laughs> no, it's all, all right. good. I can, show you, I can show you on this what how far we took it. So again, I'm going to argue that we did actually take this too far, but for demonstration purposes, it's pretty cool. Um, and this was just for our hair. All righty. Okay, I think we can jump into the makeup section. So, with makeup, and the reason we chose this image is because there's a lot of bold makeup and a lot of strong lines in here. Now, with makeup, no matter how good your makeup artist is, it's no, there's no way to get makeup perfect on skin um, in real life. It's there, you're always going to have flaws. It's the same as you can do every single beauty regime under the sun, but your skin will always have tiny imperfections. So too with makeup. And this is where um, I love to use pen pot tools. Now, if you're not familiar with the pen tool, basically what it does is it makes a selection, oh, sorry, it makes a selection based on anchor points. And those anchor points are initially straight to begin with, or if you click and drag with the mouse, you'll get these things called handlebars and they'll create a curved layer. 
a curved layer, apologies, it'll create a curved line. So you can create a more organic shape. Uh, it's worth noting that when you select this initial anchor point that you began with, if that little uh, circle shows up, it means you've got a closed path. And that basically means that your selection will be here. So when we hit command and, play and uh, excuse me, press on that path, we're going to have a selection in that shape. Your feathering regarding that will depend on uh, what you've got as your feather selection. I personally keep mine at zero because I prefer to do my own softening, but that's that's just my own personal preference. If you wanted to have a feather of about uh, five pixels, ten pixels, however many, go for it. But in this instance, I would suggest keeping it at zero. All right. So I'm going to create a new group. I'm going to call it makeup. And I delete that path. I'm going to start with the eye makeup. So we can see here she was intending to have quite a, um, a strong line. And we didn't quite get it. We've got a bit of jaggedness here. Here's a, it's a little bit out of shape. So it's a bit off. The wonderful thing about a pen path tool is unlike something like the magic wand or the color selection is that you are basically creating your own preferred selection. So in this instance, I'm going to start here and I'm going to begin to kind of trace around that makeup. Now I've got a choice of going and following the line or I can make a selection that I think would have made a better line for this makeup. So in this instance, I'm going to go straight across and I'm going to drag my pen tool the way across. You can absolutely go back and edit the pen tool. In fact, I would think I would suggest practicing with this thing is great. Um, it's an incredibly handy tool to have. Basically, you hit command, and then you can, while holding command or control, you can fiddle with it and just adjust your points. Alrighty. I think it's uh, what, what we can actually uh, point out uh, now is if you, for, let's say you, you're doing work for, for an agency or a magazine or something like that, uh, the, the, the art director would probably provide you with, uh, with a printout um, and, and uh, a couple of markings as to what they want. They would have said, listen, the line at the top left, it needs to be straight or it needs to come down in this sort of shape. And the, so they'll give you, a, a, you know, if, if it is that type of client, they'll give you a, a very um, comprehensive set of instructions to follow, um, you know, which, which is pretty cool. You know, if you're doing it um, as, your, as your own uh, project, then you've got complete free reign. Um, but there, there will be times where, especially if it's an agency environment, you know, they, they will have, you know, 100% down to the individual pixels worth of instructions for, for you to follow. They should, they should. They don't always, but they should. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I would suggest, if, especially if you are working with a makeup artist, if you are not doing the makeup yourself, always double check it to be 100% sure. Um, Right, so I've now made my pen path tool. A good way of finding, figuring out if you are happy with your pen path tool is if you kind of sit back and squint your eyes, it shouldn't, that blue line should not be, it shouldn't be jumping out at you too much. You should be able to see it, but it shouldn't be blaringly obvious. Alrighty, so we're going to create a layer in that group, and we're going to put a layer mask on it. Sorry, I need to put that underneath my dodge and burn. Right. Now we're going to take the plan stamp. I'm going to select current and below. Because we've got a, I have not blurred this mask yet, so it's going to look quite jagged. But I want to show you how to blur a mask um, uh, independently. So on this layer, I'm going to call it eyes. I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to fill in the gaps of where that mask is leading in. This was based on our initial pen tool. So now. What's really cool is we're just perfecting that line. Trying to pay attention to what um, what skin I'm grabbing. Uh, you know, it's not going to help me if I want to fill this bit in that I grab from over here. It just does not look right. So pay quite close attention to the uh, texture of your skin, to the color of your skin. Um, you don't want to. Um, uh, grab from somewhere that just does not make sense. So I'm going to go all the way up. Oops. Okay. 
and here on the other side as well. So we're just filling in where that line didn't quite meet or was a bit too uh, soft or a bit uh, skew. Uh, careful about eyelashes and stuff like that. Alrighty. So what we're also going to do is we're just going to create another layer. We're just going to call it under. We're going to pop it underneath our eye layer. And now if here, for instance, the makeup went a bit over, we can just take that out. Give us that line. Um, Obviously, this would not work with soft makeup. If you've got a very blended look, um, a harsh selection like this is not going to work. Um, Christy actually did send me a couple of options for um, which photo we could use, and one of them was an absolutely amazing look with like blue powdered makeup, which I was so tempted to use, but. Um, I knew it wasn't going to be great for this technique that I wanted to show you. Right, we've got it filled out. It looks very, very harsh. So with our mask selected, we're going to go to filter, blur, Gaussian blur. And you don't need to blur it heavily. About one or two pixels would be fine. I personally have it set to 1.7 pixels. And I think that's a little bit overblurred, to be brutally honest. But now you can see that makeup just looks more uh, solid and a bit more well lined. And you can do this on every bit of makeup. We can do it here, this bit on the ear, you can do it on the lips, you can do it on these lines. So I'm going to show you what it looked like with our practice. And I'll also show you the pen path tools. Ah, pen paths. So here we had them on her neck and collarbones, we had one on the lips. We had some on the eyes. Oh, pardon me. Uh, sorry, I've got all my color changes already set, which I didn't want to show you until right at the end. But We're okay. not looking. We won't look. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to confuse you like, OK, wait, why did it suddenly change color? <laughs> all right, so here is our finished, polished, makeup look. So we haven't changed the makeup. Um, we've, we've literally just um, smoothened it out. I'm trying to think of the correct word here, but I, I'm sure you guys can understand my meaning behind this. So again, it won't work for a blended look. We haven't uh, done it on top here because this is um, quite blended. It's not super solid. Um, so we didn't do anything to try and change this. But as for her neck, lips, and eyes, and ear, we definitely wanted to go in there. All right. So with that in mind, we can now also, using um, this mask, now change the individual color. So I'm going to create a group within this group, and I'm going to call it eye group. So, all right. I'm going to just drag this layer mask on top of it. It's going to undo what we've done until we drag those layers back into it. Oops, sorry, I don't want the under in that group. There we go. All right, cool. So that's just now created that group. Now, the wonderful thing about a group is we can go in and edit um, within that group. So it'll just affect what is in that group, provided there's a layer mask on top of it. So in this instance, we're going to change the color of this eye makeup. We don't need to use color select or anything because we've already got this mask, which sits exactly where we want it to. So there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can use a curse adjustment layer tool. You can use a color layer and paint over it in a specific color that you want. But in this case, I'm going to use the hue and saturation adjustment layer. Well, basically, if you open up your hue and saturation adjustment layer, um, You've got three options. You've got your hue, which basically looks like a big rainbow. You've got your saturation, which is a red line that goes from very, very pale red to very saturated red. And then you've got a lightness, which goes from black to white. So 
hue, as you can probably guess, will change the color, whether it goes from red to orange to green to whatever. Saturation will make the difference of the, is it a very, very bright red or is it quite a, a diluted red? And then lightness will make it quite a dark or quite a light red. All right, so in this case, we changed it to orange, but you can really go into any color. So here we uh, dragged our hue slider up about 20 and we got orange. If I continued going, we'll see, we'll start getting into the green spectrum and start getting into the cyan and then eventually end up on bright cyan. If we go all the way back, so I'm now sitting at zero on my um, hue uh, slider, it'll take us in the opposite direction of the spectrum. So it'll start going into magenta, into purple, into deep blue. And then finally, we should end on the same color that we did on the other side of the spectrum. So this is how you change the color of your makeup. We like the orange, it was quite close to the red. The, cl the, the further you go away from your original color, the more chance you're gonna get of having strange artifacts and weird things happening. So if you are doing a shoot and you are using makeup that you know you wanna change the color on, try and get your initial makeup as close to that color um, as possible, just to avoid any really strange things from happening. I'm gonna fiddle with the saturation slider a bit so I can pull it all the way up and it becomes um, toxic orange, <laughs> which <laughs> is super un um, Or I can pull it all the way down and it becomes more of like a brown kind of look, which is actually pretty cool. Um, and then I'm gonna play with the lightness. I personally don't like the lightness on hue and saturation. I find it doesn't really leave a lot of detail in. Um, but in this instance, I've pulled it down to about negative 19. I'm going to pull my saturation up a little bit more. And we've ended up with quite a nice burnt orange as opposed to that red. And as I said, you can really fiddle with this. This is entirely um, a creative uh, choice. Um, but as I said, the, the crazier you go, the more unrealistic it does become. So, sorry. In this instance, I'm going to go back into here, and you can see we did a we did an individual hue and saturation for every section of the the makeup. So here we changed the forehead, that was the eyes. Here we changed the lips, and then we did the neck as well. And what's wonderful about uh, selecting it differently from here is if I decided actually I want my eyes in this one to be turquoise, for whatever reason, then I can go in there and change it and it's not going to affect the rest of the makeup. Um, but yeah, we quite, we quite like the monochromatic thing. I think we changed it because we wanted it to match the corn quite nicely. I think that was why we decided to go with orange. Okay. Yeah, I quite like the, right. um, this, this, that uh, more orangey uh, feel. I think it's, uh, it certainly makes it a bit more cohesive, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, if you've got a color scheme and you want to sit with that color scheme, then it's super, super helpful. That's my dodge and burn. Uh, the other thing that hue and saturation is great for is changing eye color. And now, this you definitely want to be careful with, especially if you're working with beauty. Um, you don't want to give anyone an unrealistic um, eye color. I just actually want to show you here. Um, so you can see here in the uh, the makeup on the top of her forehead, you're getting like a little bit of pink in it. That's what I mean by you're going to start getting strange artifacts in some of your, um, if you go too far on the spectrum. So in this instance, it wasn't quite understanding what to do with these magenta bits. So yeah, that's why we're getting a little bit of a weirdness. Um, to fix that, what we could do is just create a color adjustment layer. Uh, sorry, a, a layer with a color blend mode, sorry. So it's at about 20%, uh, your, your brush flow to about 20%. And then I'm just gonna go in there and just kind of paint over it. But that's really only if you're getting like a very, very strange artifact um, 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, eye color. Yes. Right. So we decided to make her eyes blue. It was a really nice pop against that orange. So we actually went on the slider on our hue slider and took it all the way to the opposite side. We're at plus 166 with our saturation at plus 22. Um, so it was quite a big change. The difference, what we did here is we lowered the opacity of the hue and saturation there. If we had brought it up to 100%, you can see it's quite, um, it's quite jarring. Whereas if you keep it at about between 60 and 70%, it does look a little bit more realistic. And again, we could have gone with anything. If we wanted it to be more in the green, we could have gone with the green. If we decided we actually want to make our eyes pink, we could have made our eyes pink. Um, but yeah, that's a wonderful thing about colors is as long as you're not sticking to a brief, you can go in any direction you want to. Um, it's probably one of my, my favorite things to do in Photoshop is randomly change the colors of certain things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Okay, so just to start finishing up now. Right. We used a dodge and burn uh, layers to uh, contour. So if you if you follow the Kardashians at any point in time, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> For the gentlemen in the, in the audience, contouring is basically we are manipulating the shadows and highlights to try and bring out um, the features of the model a little bit better. So in this case, I'm going to turn off that burn there and just show you. So we've dodged in certain areas of her face just to kind of bring them out a little bit more. Let me show you what that mask looks like. So we've done it on the nose, we've done it on the cupid's bow, a little bit here on the lip, definitely on her cheeks chin, forehead, in her hair, that kind of thing. Now this is going to be different for every single face, so I'm not really going to go too much into this as it is. But if you really need to or want to know what to look at, what I actually suggest is looking up contouring makeup on Google Images and it will show you where makeup artists will typically apply shadows and where they will apply highlights. How that works with makeup is essentially the same as how it would work on uh, retouching, um, unless you wanted a very, very strange effect in terms of like morphing the shape of a face. Um, but that's that's quite extensive, so I'm not going to cover it here. You can see on our burn layer as well, we've gone here on the side of the nose, here on the cheeks, um, went a little bit here under the lips. Um, we also just went in the makeup a little bit just to kind of um, make it pop a little bit more. Um, I think actually we did overdo this a bit. So I'm going to take this whole group and just bring the opacity of it down to about 64%, just so that it's not quite so harsh. Alrighty. The other thing that we did was we popped a gradient map onto her, onto her skin with a soft light blending mode. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you what colors we chose because it's not bringing up my windows. So I'm gonna leave that for this tutorial until we figure out that particular um, technical issue. And then, yeah, we will bring it back in another day, simply because I'd rather actually explain that one while um, selecting the colors. Okay. As for the color grading, which we did last, I use um, the infinite color panel, um, which is fantastic. If you are really into your color grading, I'd really suggest investing in it. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful plugin. Um, I am not affiliated with them. I don't earn anything from them. I just find them a fantastic little tool. Um, if you're not really big into your color grading, not a worry. You can also do it manually using a combination of curves and gradient maps and color lookup. Um, but this was really fantastic because it's it's the lazy way of doing it. It does it for me. I say, yes, I like it. No, I don't. And we pop it on. So again, I'm not going to go too crazy into that because I can't really take credit for it. It was done with a panel. But I think color grading is definitely something that we can talk about in the future. Cool. I've put, uh, I put a link to the infinite color panel in the, uh, the discussion. 
so people can go and have a look yeah. at that uh, and check it out yeah like i said it's definitely not a necessity i i, I only recently got it like maybe about mm, eight months ago but i i find it's a lot of fun to use so if if you want to if you want a toy then you know <laughs> grab that and especially if you're really into your color grading then yeah go for it so this is basically how we arrived at the final image um like i said i didn't want to go too in depth on every single individual thing because we could literally be here for six hours if i did but that's basically the process. And ultimately, it's about practice. It's about your own decisions of what you want to leave in, what you want to take out, where you want to arrive at your final image. And most importantly, working non-destructively. So if you feel like something's not working, you can go back, you can take it out, you can change it, and you haven't lost hours and hours and hours of work, nor does your image look weird or whatever the case may be because you've worked in your layers the wrong way. So as long as you remember to keep your pixel layers at the bottom and your adjustment layers on top, you shouldn't have a big issue with that. All right. That's very cool. I'm, I'm going to put you next to me again like that. All right. There we go. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the importance of, of, of being as non-destructive or editing as non-destructive as possible is, is huge. Um, I remember when when Photoshop, uh, I think it you, you could you could go back once, so Command Z once. Now you can just go back, 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 back. You know, to, back in those days, it, yeah, it was, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, so so there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, sort of positives and and things like that that uh, that we've got now. But but the and second to that is is remembering to save. You know, if you've gone for 45 oh minutes and you haven't saved it. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that is my worst habit is not saving. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, that's also crucial because I mean, you know, let's, let's say Photoshop doesn't really crash, uh, you know, uh, that much that, that I've noticed, but, but let's say it does, or let's say ESCOM decides to change its mind and put you on the schedule. We, we live in South Africa. It happens way more often than we'd like. So, exactly. yes, please save so, so non-destructive editing, save. Uh, <laughs> two, two, big, uh, two very big takeouts from, uh, from today. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, fantastic. Thank you. I, I, I'm so, so, so impressed. Um, I think it's, uh, it's such a nice difference between the, the, the start and finish. Um, and I, I think that, you know, as you said, depending on how far you want to go, who the client is, um, and what their budget is, you can really, really go far, or you can just do small parts of uh, of what you showed us uh, today. Um, and I, I really do think that the uh, you know we can look at things like uh, you know and break down the individual parts of of what uh, what you spoke about today into shorter bits that um, that we can do as you know uh, as we discussed like the, the two minute tutorial or, or whatever it is. We'll yeah, we'll kind of play with that. Absolutely, and it was unfortunate with the with the um, with the windows not opening because I feel like that that that's really so much diff harder to follow along if you can't see what I'm doing. Um, so we will have to solve that that problem for the next time because um, I do feel like you guys lost out on a little bit. If, if obviously if you want to go back and you're going to go watch the YouTube channel with um, with that on. That's perfect, but it's so much nicer to see what actually happens in real time as you as you adjust it. Absolutely, yeah. I think the 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 the, the main reason for that is it's um, it's seen as a separate window uh, mm. than than the the Photoshop one. So what we might need to do um, for for future ones like this is um, do a, a screen capture. So you know, record yeah. you as as you're doing it, and then we can bring it in. Um, and and you know we can stream that or run that as a as a as a, a yeah. video and, and you can sort of talk through it. We'll we'll kind of work it out. We'll see how how best uh, to do that. Um, yeah. And so Taryn's got a, a, a question. Taryn Goldman, uh, do you do digital art or or composites? Um, we do. It's honestly not something that we get um, requested a lot. Um, I think it's because. A lot of composites seem to be uh, thought of as more like a graphic design side. Most of the composites that we get to do is more from uh, product photography that mm. you know uh, 
obviously you can't t get it perfect in one shot. We need to kind of uh, do quite a few of them. Um, digital art, I, I love doing it, but uh, funny enough, it's just it's not one of those things that we get requested very often. Um, but in terms of do we do it, absolutely. I absolutely love doing it. Um, it's it's one of the most powerful things you can do in Photoshop. So um, I think that must definitely be something that we talk about in the future in terms of um, one of our tutorials or one of our videos. Absolutely. I, I remember um, we, we had a client years ago that uh, was a, a, a film and commercial production company. And um, yeah. I, I managed to get hold of a, a Photoshop file, a PSD of uh, one of the, the movie posters. And I was amazed at, at, at like overlays and this and that. And I just thought, what is going on here? Because there was just so many different techniques that, uh, you know, you switch that off and, and it's a completely different feel. Now, wh where is that? What, what's, you know, what's going on? Um, I, I think that you can get super complicated with them, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and create some fantastic uh, composites. Um, but yeah, let's, let's yeah. look at that um, as, as something we can look at in the future. Definitely, definitely. And what you say about how complicated they get, my goodness. Um, it's a pity that Photoshop files only go up to two gigabytes and then you can start saving the formats because you can so easily pass that two gigabyte, yeah. uh, that two gigabyte limit when you're doing composites. It's insane. Especially when, uh, you know, the, the, the files that you're putting into those layers are, I mean, you know, cameras now shooting uh, 100 uh, megapixel shots uh, and, and higher. Uh, you know, if you've got... It's dozens of layers doing uh, different things it's it's uh, it, it, it will reach it very very quickly yes yes absolutely <laughs> okay cool so um i don't see any other questions in uh, in the chat at the moment so um yeah i think we can wrap it up thank you very much uh, for uh, for this uh, uh, live edit i think it's very cool i think it's, it's awesome that we you sort of turned it around in in, in a couple of days um, and I think for the first one, yeah, it was fantastic. Not much, not much prep work. Yeah. Not much prep time for that. But it, I, I think it, uh, for the first one, it was fantastic. Um, I, you know, I, I, the only thing that um, that we need to work on is the is those panels and see how we can get those um, wow. you know showing up. But the, you know, for the rest of it, uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, the old dog learned some new tricks, um, and we'll be <laughs> applying them um, rigorously. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I can't. I can't wait to see what comes out of this. I really, really hope that uh, you guys get some submissions with um, some new editing techniques. It would be fantastic to see, um, you know, just how you guys put a spin on these. Because as I said, this is just my way of doing it, yeah. and this is just what I found works. But um, every everyone is going to have a different take on it. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 use uh, different levels of um, you know of what uh, of the techniques that you used. Um, so yeah, there we go. So uh, Taryn says it's awesome. I mean, uh, that was great. Thank you, Elska. Fantastic. <laughs> blah 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 blah. So I, I think it went down well uh, for the first time. I think it went yeah, down really well. Listen, thank you guys. I was so nervous about doing this. So um, I, I appreciate the um, the support. It's also interesting because I'm just looking through the. Um, the, the comments on how many people use a mouse uh, versus how many people use a tablet. Um, Interesting, so I think huh? that should also be something that we talk about in the future is retouching with the mouse using uh, versus versus the tablet. Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm not affiliated with anyone. I don't want to tell you. You have to go up and buy this in order to, to... No, no, you really don't. We all start some way. So if you're working with the mouse, then I think it's important that we find a technique that works with the mouse. Absolutely. I mean, I, I know that um, at one stage uh, with the, the retouching, you know, moving repetitively left and right, left and right, left and right, um, I started getting a bit of, uh, you know, carpal tunnel in, uh, you know, in my, yeah. in my forearm. Um, and it was almost impossible for me to hold the mouse. So I, that's, that's when I got a, a tablet. Um, and using the pen, within a couple of days, it was gone. There was the, absolutely no pain whatsoever. So from, from an ergonomic I, I, point I of see, view. I, I have the opposite problem. I, I had um, inflamed inflamed joints in my hand because I, I'm constantly holding the pen. So wow. um, the, 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 the lesson to take from this is switch often. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. And I, I, I mean, that, 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 that even comes down to, um, you know, it, I recently hurt my back 
uh, and I've, I've had to do a fair amount of standing um, because sitting down was just so painful. And, and that's exactly it. You know, the, there's a, we do so much repetitive uh, work. Um, you know, you, you're sitting and, you're, and your right wrist is going, cha, 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 cha. you know, I think if, if you can change, change it up and, 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 and use a mouse, use a pen, stand, sit, whatever, it's, uh, at the end of the day, your body is going to thank you for it. Um, but, yes. but also I think it's, there, there could also be different techniques that, that you have to play with um, when you are using a pen versus a mouse, etc. So that can also change it up and you, know, you just don't get relaxed and set in your, in your ways. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you can see it behind me. I don't think you can if I just uh, adjust yeah, the screen. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've, got a, we've got a Huey on Canvas Pro, which is a, a digital tablet um, as opposed to the Wacom, which is just a standard pen tablet. Yeah. And that one, you'll put more with it in front of you, whereas the, uh, the Wacom tablet I tend to have here at the side where I would hold my mouse. So um, in terms of also just your, your your longevity on yourself as well as your equipment it's it's just great to change it up figure out what works for you try and change your position quite a bit because as you saw we can be sitting here for hours and hours exactly and hours. exactly exactly so, yeah please please don't, please don't get hurt trying to do any of this it's really not necessary stand up <laughs> get some coffee all that stuff yes uh, health and safety recommends that you get up every yes, 30 minutes <laughs> health and safety um Things that need to be sign the waiver, folks. Sign exactly, the waiver. exactly. <laughs> We're not responsible. Uh, all oh. right, so so uh, Gemma, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate it. I, I think everyone else uh, really enjoyed it as well. Um, and um, yeah, we'll chat about uh, what we can do going forward and um, and how we can put some panels on this for for this particular one before I put it up on uh, on YouTube. So yeah, yes, just a huge thank you to you. I really really appreciate it. It was absolutely fantastic. Oh, Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, I can't wait to do this again. Fantastic. Thanks, Gemma. Have a good weekend. Cheers. You too. Bye. Bye.